So I'm AJ, I'm a consultant in sports medicine at London Bridge Hospital. Nice to be back again. Uh, and today we're going to be going through shoulder, all things shoulder, clinical assessment, um, and just how you might approach a, a shoulder case in your practice. So what we'll try and cover today, we'll talk about the clinical history of the shoulder, um, just understanding the key points in terms of things you might try and ascertain from speaking to the patient before you even get your hands on them. We'll go through some case histories. I think that's, that's always a, a good way of trying to get through salient points of a, an examination and a clinical assessment. So we'll have some key, um, key pathologies and we'll talk through them, very interactive. So I'll be asking questions and asking you to get your thoughts in as well. We'll obviously talk through the key examination points and at the end we'll, we'll try and get across and do a, an ultrasound uh, assessment as well. So a little bit about me. I'm a sports medicine consultant. Um, I um, worked a lot in the military in the past and, and now I um, am the lead uh, sports medicine physician at London Bridge Hospital. I also work for British Tennis and I'm a lecturer at King's College London. I have uh, no, other, no other conflicts of interest. Right, so in terms of a sports medicine history, remember, when someone comes in with a shoulder pathology, it's not just about the shoulder. So we're looking at lots of different other things. Um, importantly, how they injured their shoulder. So normally the mechanism gives away the pathology in you know, nine times out of the 10. So commonly you'll see things like throwing or overhead. And I think throwing and overhead athletes or, or participants are a very, very key sector of shoulder injuries. So you need to take them into special consideration. A lot of our history and examination will be focused towards that as well. Repetitive stress, so that could be sitting at your desk, working in a, in a sort of uh, un, very uh, unhelpful, not biomechanically supportive position. It could be repetitive stress at another task you're doing, DIY or something like that. Below impacts tackle, so those are the trauma type cases we might see, the rugby injuries, the fall onto the shoulders. Swinging, climbing, so you know, sporting context is changing now. So a lot more people are climbing, bouldering, whole new different types of shoulder injuries, different types of mechanisms that are coming up. Locks and bars, anyone know what sports you might find those in? A lot of martial arts, everyone seems to be doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu these days, so you might see that a lot more. Shoulder grapples, pulling shoulders in all sorts of funny ranges. So it's important to ask about, you know, what was the lock you were in, what was the mechanism there? Um, rowing uh, and other sort of gym-based activities can also aggravate the shoulder. Training history, the volume when it comes to shoulder injuries is often a lot harder to ascertain than it is in the lower limb. So in the lower limb, you can ask things like, how many miles have you run? How many steps have you done? Uh, you know, what was your speed of running? When the shoulder is actually quite, quite difficult to get that specific type of data. So what I tend to ask things is, you know, how many bowls have you bowled? How many overs? How many serves? How many swings? And often, actually, if you don't, if you ask patients that question, they'll, they'll have a good idea. How much, how much DIY did you do over the weekend? Was it one hour? Was it four hours? So it's really, really important to try and get a quantitative measure to that as well. Conditions, you know, so often you'll find in the sporting context, someone has changed condition, they've, they've moved from grass court tennis to clay court tennis, or they've moved from the driving range from a very hard surface to a, to a soft grass surface. It's, it's important to get a context of, you know, what kind of conditions they're playing in. Session type, so again, for, for different sports people, it could be, oh, I, I went to the tennis court and I wanted to do... Uh, I mean, to prove my serves, I've done I've served a thousand balls all in one go. You know, so it's just trying to understand what what they were doing, what they're trying to achieve. And we talked about load monitoring. Um, very difficult to do that from um, sort of markers unless you try and get into the elite levels. But often it's a subjective statement of saying yes, I've I, you know I've I've been doing X amount per week. Changes from the norm. You know, the usual patterns are like. Okay, summer's out, everyone's got the golf, dust off the golf clubs and off they go. Or, uh, or, or they're trying to get back on court or they're recovering from an injury. And we'll talk about a few of those other stresses because people often use upper body strength and conditioning training in sports when they can't do lower body. So that's, a, that's often a co-committant pathology there. They've actually got an injury lower down and they're trying to substitute by doing a lot more upper body, particularly in the gym setting. People use sport as a reliever, so financial, academic stresses, just making sure that um, you've covered that and making sure there's no sort of ulterior motives going on here. 
like any good sports medicine history, you want to ask about energy availability, you know, are the bones healthy, are the tendons healthy, is there anything going on from a dietary point of view, mental health, you know, are, are they using a particular type of sport as a, as a reliever or a, a de-stressor from a mental health um, point of view, either from, as far as exercise addiction and dependence. Um, other things like menstrual cycle, very important actually when you're looking at uh, energy availability and relative energy deficiency. So making sure you've asked your young female players in particular about their cycle and menstrual periods. You, you actually do see quite a lot of stress injuries in the adolescent upper arm. And I think the adolescents actually require their own special context in terms of how deep into questions you go about their, about their growth, their maturation and the development. Sleep quality, very important. A lot of shoulders cause uh, a lot of sleep problems. So sleeping on that side, difficult. Is it waking you up once a night? Is it just illegal? Or are you up every hour with throbbing shoulder pain? And if you've got access, it's always useful to ask for sports assessment video analysis. So making sure you can get some accurate footage, making, you know, even someone just filming themselves on an iPhone where you can get slow motion video, really, really helpful, C can show you all sorts of interesting stuff to do with shoulder biomechanics you would not get from just talking to a patient. So asking them to film themselves and go from that point of view. Right, so case number one, let's get cracking. 42-year-old male complaining of right shoulder pain while swimming, particularly during the catch phase. So the catch phase could be during a breaststroke, arm in, pulling back. So it's initially when they are pulling the water back. That's what we call the catch phase. Started about four months ago and is now sort of progressing. Now finds that they're unable to swim more than sort of 200 meters in the swimming pool until it gets really, really sore. Um, painful from working at home when on the desk and the difficulty reaching up and getting dressed. So often you'll say, uh, ask patients, oh, when you're getting something from the top shelf, is it sore? Or actually, if you're putting your hand in behind the jacket and into your, getting the blazer on, is that sore? Not really affecting his sleep. He's not had any previous falls or trauma from that point of view. So in your exercise history, you ask, you know, what, what do you do from a sport point of view? He's, he's an Ironman. Well, he wants to be an Ironman. He's trained for his first one in three months, but he's used to doing Olympic distance. Um, he's got a strength program and he's a unilateral breather. So basically what that means is when he's swimming, he only breathes to one side. He doesn't bilateral breathe. Um, he's got some shin splints. So he's been coming treatment with physiotherapy for that. He's a, he's a lawyer, quite a stressful job. GP has quite, you know, helpfully organized an x-ray, which just came back as normal. And he's had some physiotherapy, but, the, you know, just couldn't get anywhere with it. It was just really, really sore from that point of view. So the, the, the things in this history I, I would have thought are, are important is one, you know, he's, there's been a significant increase in training load because he's trying to now do an Ironman. So he's had to massively increase the amount of swimming he's doing. He's also got shin splints, which means he's probably not running. So he's probably spending more time in the pool. And often you say, oh, OK, yeah, I'm, I'm spending a lot more time swimming from that point of view. Also, he's a unilateral breather, so that there is a, there's going to be some form of asymmetry going on here. Because actually, anyone, you know, if you're a long-distance swimmer, you want to try and keep it symmetrical and breathe on both sides. Also, it's during the catch phase. So that means when his shoulder is up and pulling down. So in my mind, I would be thinking more of a subacromial impingement or more of a rotator cuff sort of pathology. So that's when we're going through our assessment, that's how we'll try and, uh, and narrow down from that point of view. Right, so we're going to our examination. So the first thing you always want to think about when you're doing your examination is where are you? What kind, of, what kind of examination is appropriate for the clinical setting you're in? If you're in an A&E department, you're not going to spend loads of time doing very detailed sports medicine assessments. You know? If you're in a hospital setting or a, 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 a GP setting, again, you might want to tailor your clinical assessment according to that also might lead to how well you can see the shoulder and how well you can get exposed. So we've got our, uh, our model here, whose name is? Gigi. Gigi. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. So Gigi's helpfully come today in a sports top. And I think if you want to get any useful information from a shoulder examination, you have to have adequate exposure. There's, you, you're, not, you're going to miss so much stuff if you could get them in a t-shirt or don't get them fully exposed. And you can't always assume that guys are happy to take their top off in a, in a, in a gym environment and things like that. So just bear in mind, it is a fairly sensitive and intimate examination. Um, I would always ask uh, a patient to bring appropriate clothing for, a, you know, for, for that examination of that body part. Uh, and usually in women, that means sports bras. 
we'll start off with an inspection. So you can have a look at the inspection from the front. So just asking the patient to stand as relaxed as you can. You have a look at shoulder height. Is one, height, one shoulder higher than the other? Is there any asymmetries there? You can have a look at the pectoralis muscle. Is there any tightness, tension going on? Is there any wasting? Is there any wasting, particularly in the anterior deltoid muscle here? When you get a side-on view, you get your first glimpse of scapular mechanics. You can understand if someone is very protracted and very hunched over, which can often be more common in men, but people do a lot of gym-based stuff that is very chest-heavy and they're very tight, particularly in the, in the pectoralis major and minor muscles. So that pulls the shoulder forward. Uh, and you can see that usually here as a, as a slightly natural protracted position, but often people, when they're relaxed, they do so. Um, so getting a good, good, uh, good sense of alignment from the side. When you go to the back, so it's usually asks you to turn around. Yep, in your face there. And again, hair tied up, hair out of the way, useful, but you can tuck that in front. So you, as you can see already, you, you've got a bit of the scapula that's covered up here. So in an ideal world, you want to have this completely exposed so you can see the inside border of the shoulder blades and, and find out what's going there. Because often you'll see they're sitting in slightly different positions from that point of view. Again, assess shoulder height, have a look at just basic spine mechanics. Is there an element of scoliosis? Is there an element of uh, curvature in the spine that haven't picked up? Are they excessively forward bending? That's gonna affect shoulder movement from that point of view. So having a good look from the front and the back. Have they had previous surgery? Is there any arthroscopy scars, any porthole scars from that point of view? Right. You, we've, I think you've probably talked about cervical spine assessment and thoracic spine assessment this morning. Doing that in the shoulder is key because you, you want to make sure there's no cervicogenic irritation, nerve root irritation that can be masquerading as shoulder pain. And that's really, really common. So making sure there's no pathology in the neck, either from tightness of muscles on from nerve root irritations, making sure that they are cleared and you're happy with the shoulder range. So that could be just a simple range of movement exercise with the shoulder. Often I'll get them sitting on the couch and doing a thoracic mobility exercise to make sure is the symmetry there. So for example, with, the, with our case one patient, you might find he's got a bit more rotation on one side, on the side he breathes in swimming than the other, because he's more used to doing that than the other side. So that those kind of subtleties are, are quite key actually. Scapular assessment. So in my mind, the shoulder blade starts with the scapula. So you have to make sure that you give the scapula due attention and under, understand how it moves and where it goes from there. So there's different ways of doing that. You can either get them standing up and, and with their hands by their side, or you can get hands on, hands on the shoulders. And just the simple motions could be elevation. So I could say, try and lift your shoulder blades as high as you can, and then as far down as you can. Okay, and then back to neutral again. So what you're looking for is smoothness of rhythm, um, sorry, smoothness of movement, the rhythm, and asymmetries. Those are the key things you're looking for. And often you'll find in anyone who does any sorts of sport, particularly a one-handed sport, there will be asymmetries. You know, you, one side will be more developed than the other. So you might find muscle imbalances, difference in movements, but it's just all important and it builds up your, your sort of clinical picture. The other two movements we'll do, so hands on hips again, is bring your shoulder blades as forward as you can and then as back as you can. So seeing how the scapulae retract and then protract is also really important as well. Um, you can get them to do things like a scapular press, so hands against the wall, and then getting to move their shoulder blades like that as well, and understanding when there's a force going through and there's a closed chain movement, what we call, um, how do the scapulae move then? The last one I'll get you to do is just pull your hands up nice and slowly up to the top, and then down. So again, are they symmetrical? Are they smooth? Is there any winging or what we call scapular dyskinesia? And we'll, we'll talk about that a bit later on. So shoulder range, um, you can either do standing or lying down. Uh, and I think, you know, in, this, in the first instance, a standing assessment gives you a good, good idea. So the first thing I'd get them to do is, on the non-affected side, get them to go up to the top and then down and see how, how the movement is, how smooth it is from that point of view, and then compare to the non-affected side. So we're doing active movements first. Right, so if they're up to here and you find, uh, this, uh, so this was the left, it was the left side for this patient, and they got sore, you can just try and test that 
passively and say, actually, you know, what is the end range and how, how far is that further than their active range? And is there a soft feel there or is there an end feel there? And obviously, you can be able to look at the patient's face and ascertain, is that the point where they're getting the pain right at the end range? When they are forward flexing, you remember that's not all coming from the shoulder joint. A lot of that is or the glenohumeral joint. A lot of that is coming from the scapula itself. So what you could do is try and stabilize the scapula and then get them to do that again. And then you'll feel a point where the scapula starts to move. So you could say, Gigi, probably up, about up to there, or maybe a bit low actually, is shoulder, um, glenohumeral joint movement, and then this, the rest of that is scapula rotation. In someone who's got glenohumeral joint restriction, either from arthritic change or tightness of the joint, that might happen a lot earlier. So they might be using their scapula just to get that forward bend. So you have to different, try and your best to differentiate between those two. And having a hand to give you that feedback on the scapula is really important. So we'll do uh, rotations now. So very simply, hands out in front, and then with the, with the non-affected side, out to the side, and then back, and then the other side. So this is external rotation, right? So you can see, actually, when Gigi goes on this side, she's probably got a lot more external rotation on the right side. Are you right-handed? Yeah. Do you play any right-handed sports? Yeah. Yeah. So, so she's got a lot more external rotation on that side. And that's very common in people who are doing a lot of throwing motions because they, they end up getting a bit more range on that side. What sports do you play? Cricket, netball, variety. Okay, fine. And on this side as well. So... So you can, at the end here, you can feel it's a little bit stiffer um, and there's, there's a bit more of a block on there, right? We can test range, um, test range lying down as well and we'll, we'll do that at the end. So if you turn around. Oh, that's fine, that's fine. Right, internal rotation. The simplest way of doing that is hand behind the back. So start with the dominant side to the right side. How high can you get your hand behind your back? That high? And you can, what you can do is measure either the centre of the hand or some people use the thumb, but I like, I like doing the centre hand. How high up have they got around the back? Is that mid thoracic? And you can even get the level if you want to from that point of view. So that's probably a bit of a thracker lumbar level there. And the other side. So one thing to note is actually she's got a lot more internal rotation on her non dominant side. Uh, and her non-sporting hand, which means there's more of a bias towards external rotation on the right side, which could lead to a few other things that we'll talk about in a second, mainly glenohumeral internal rotation deficit. So we'll, we'll talk on that in, about in a minute. So functional movements. At this point, I'll, you can face the front if you want. I'll normally get people into the gym sort of setting to do most of my examinations because you've got more space and you know, I've, I've, you know, if you've got access to a gym, that's a great place to do it. This is the time where you can get out your tennis racket, you can get out your golf club, you say, you know, show me your swing, how does it feel, what's the movement? We don't have a swimming pool here, so what we could say is, you know, what is the movement actually, where is it in the stroke? Is it up here or is it when you're catching? Get them to demonstrate from that point of view. In my functional assessment, there'll always be a biomechanical assessment as well. So it'll be taking through someone, understanding what their core function is like, understanding what their symmetry is like from that point of view. It doesn't have to be overly vast for the shoulder, for shoulder assessment, but as long as you're considering that, that's good. So palpation, essentially, you're starting from uh, the sternoclavicular joint. Uh, sometimes people can have crepitus and pain around the sternoclavicular joint, uh, and you're moving down along the collarbone, getting onto the AC joint here, Again, another very common place to have pain. And often if patients do have AC joint problems, they'll be tender. And then you can try and do a dynamic movement with the AC joint to see if there's any clicking or popping in that area. You can go just off the AC joint and you can get into that subacromial space. So often, again, AC joints uh, can be quite flared, but people with subacromial bursitis can get a bit of inflammation there. You can go down and palpate the long, long head of biceps as well, just to see if there's any, any pain from that point of view. It's always, always important to palpate the back if you turn around. Yeah, well, don't worry, don't worry. You, can do, you can do that when we do the stage. So I will palpate along um, the supraspinatus fossa to see what the muscle bulk is there. You know, is, is, how, what's the muscle feeling like? Is there any knots? Is there a lot of tension stored there? Infraspinatus fossa, and again, the medial border of the scapula, really important. Lots and lots of people you'll probably find have lots of tension around the medial border of the scapula, just tight levator scapulae, tight rhomboids. So it's, it's understanding what differences are between those two sides. So we're going to start calling on our special tests. It is a bit of a minefield when it comes to the shoulder and special tests. There are lots and lots of tests. Um, and I think, you know, rather than being 
quite, rest quite uh, restrictive about what tests you use. It's important to use them as tools. So each test will give you a different flavor of the particular type of shoulder you're trying to examine. So it's making sure that you call on each of these tests in an appropriate way. You don't, you're not trying to bash them all through and trying to build a clinical picture. It's like, actually, for this particular type of patient who's got impingement when they're swimming, what tests might be more appropriate? The other thing I would say about rotator cuff testing is that you know, there's a lot of evidence now that suggests actually the cuff doesn't activate in isolation. The cuff act activates as an entire body. So you often get co-committant activation of the front, the back, and all aspects of the rotator cuff. So can you actually isolate different muscle groups? I think, you know, I think it's still worth trying because actually if you do have isolated pathologies like a subscapularis tear or uh, supraspinatus uh, tendinopathy, you can actually catch them out on, on certain tests. So it's making sure you try and at least have some idea of which part of the cuff, um, whether you're isolating individual muscles, I don't think it's important, but uh, trying, to get, trying to get that point of view is, is quite key. The, the bear hug sign is probably the most sensitive in my point of view. So that's holding your hand up like that and not letting me try and move you. So count, hold your hand there. So there's good power. Essentially, subsubtilaris is an internal rotator. So it's making sure internal rotation is uh, not being affected from that point of view. So if there's good power there, then they're likely that actually subscap isn't doing all right. You've got two variations, belly off sign and belly press test. So I like the, the lift off test. If you turn around again on that side, try and push out against me. So good power from that point of view. So that's suggesting that you know, internal rotation is not too bad. Um, infraspinitis is an external rotator working along with Terry's minor. Lots of different ways of doing that. You can either get them to hold out and get them to push against you. And sometimes, if there is a bit of a lag, what happens is, after you let go, the, the shoulder just pops back. You can either do that at zero degrees or at 90 degrees. So you're holding the shoulder, and if there's a bit of a lag, sometimes the, sh the shoulder drops. Um, sorry, the, 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 the forearm rotates like that. If that does happen, that would suggest there's you know, quite a significant cuff tear there, and the the infraspinatus power has gone quite a lot. Uh, Supraspinatus is, you know, uh, the one that everything seems a bit, a bit more, um, there are lots of tests, they all kind of look and sound the same in, in a lot of ways. Full can test and empty can test is essentially hands out by your side, as, as if you're holding a full can of Coke, up to the top, and all the way to the top. And on this one, she says, yes, that's painful on, on the affected shoulder side. So you can bring that down, and you can ask them to modify that. So hands in, and then going up to the top again. Often, if there is some mild subacromial bursitis or impingement, the empty can test does exacerbate that more than the full can test. And that's really important to work out from that point of view. Um, near sign is when you're actually doing that actively. You're, you're pushing it from that point of view. What we do often do in clinic is do the nears test, and then do an injection to the subacromial space and then do it again. And that's really, really telling as to whether there is a, um, a rotator cuff pathology or a, you know, a rotator cuff bursa irritation from that point of view. Biceps testing, speeds test, is essentially getting them to have a straight arm. Try and push against my hand if you can. And what we're doing is activating the biceps tendon from that point of view. And up here, and again, working through different, different ranges. So when we do our ultrasound, this is what we see. Um, we see a markedly inflamed subacromial bursa. So at the top there, you can see that the, the, the area is really, really thickened, so there's lots of fluid in that subacromial space from that point of view. This is the subacromial space, and this is the inflamed tendon. So this shows lots of degenerative change in the rotator cuff tendon, and here you've got a marked thickened of a subacromial bursa, which looks like this on the MRI. So all this white is fluid within the subacromial bursa from that point of view. So actually, for this, for this athlete, you can, well, this person, you can drain the subacromial bursa, you can inject an anti-inflammatory, uh, you can get them working on the rotator cuff again. Working on that thoracic mobility is very important, making sure that they're, you know, they're, they're as symmetrical as possible, trying to get him to bilateral breathe. Just talked about the swimming volumes, talked about how else they can train, uh, can they do a lot more cycling, you know, the other component of triathlon. And also, we knew that it was affected by his home setup, so making sure his home setup is key as well. 
So we'll just talk a little bit about the, the um, rotator cuff in that there are lots of things that stabilize the shoulder joint, and the shoulder's being stabilized across different planes. So the coronal front-on plane, the axial plane, the transverse plane, and the, 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 all the planes combined. So all these muscles are trying to balance and cause stability. And I often liken it to a golf club on a tee. So that's, that's the, the biomechanics of the glenohumeral joint, and that's what we're trying to stabilize. So it's a very, very shallow joint. And often what happens is when supraspinatus doesn't work, fails, is irritated, it gets inflamed, deltoid takes over, and then you get what we call this migration of the humeral head upwards. And what happens there is you end up going on a vicious cycle. So the supraspinatus fails, the whole humeral head migrates upwards, it gets more inflamed, it gets more pinched, and you get into this vicious cycle uh, and, and problems as you on from there. So it's, in, it's important to recognize that and then trying to correct that from that point of view. Right, so key take-homes from that case is ultrasound is, in my opinion, the gold standard for assessing rotator cuff. You get so much more detail than you can do from an MRI. Uh, you know, rotator cuff can be inhibited from bursal irritation, and sometimes it's impossible to rehab really, really angry shoulders with lots of information around a subacronial bursa. So you're much better off injecting it, calming it down, and then going from that point, uh, and then trying to get them into a good rehab program. Right, case number two. 58-year-old lady, pain and stiffness in left shoulder. So started about six weeks ago, now getting, bit, now getting lots of worse. Eight weeks ago, she had a fall. She tripped, stabilized herself with the left shoulder again. Um, now she's unable to get dressed. With women, it's always important to ask about the bra strap test. It's difficult to put on their, um, on their bra from behind. Difficult to do hair as well. Now affecting sleep, right? Often, glenohumeral joint pathologies are the ones that affect sleep. So lying on that shoulder, aches, can radiate down the arm as well. Um, you know, she, she's tried to keep fit and active. She enjoys yoga, unable to do that now. She's hypertensive, pre-diabetic. Uh, GP, again, has done an x-ray, really helpfully. No fractures, no arthritic changes. Uh, they've also organized an ultrasound, which shows the, the, the rotator cuff is absolutely fine. No subacromial bursitis. Had physio, which actually did help, but, but now it's, it's, it's sort of plateaued a little bit. Okay, so again, we go through our examination. We know the setting. We know we're appropriately exposed. We have a look. There's nothing really to see, obviously, from, from, from a shoulder mechanics or scapula mechanics point of view. Um, when we work at shoulder range, we see there's a markedly uh, restriction into external rotation. So external rotation is very, very stuck. And when you get them lying down as well, they've got not much going on. You can also measure external rotation in 90 degrees, which I think is also quite useful from that point of view. Um, but bear in mind, a lot of, some of that is happening from the scapula as well. So if you get them lying down, you can stabilize the scapula and they get a bit more of a true measure of external rotation. So as you might you know, imagine, a lot more, lot more external rotation on the right side than the left. But in our case history, very restricted into external rotation. Here you can see that the, the, the green circle is highlight, uh, highlighting an inferior auxiliary thickening, which there's not many signs, actually very sensitive signs, to look at a frozen shoulder on ultrasound or MRI, but generally an MRI can pick it up a bit better because you can look at this, um, the, the bottom of the capsule essentially to look if it's thickened from that point of view. How do you treat this? Physiotherapy can be very useful. Again, Corticosteroid injections have their place depending on which, which time of phase of the cycle you get it in. And there's a procedure called a hydrodilatation. You're putting fluid into the capsule. It expands, it expands, it expands, and it releases. Very good procedure, very great outcomes. It's one of, those, one of those things you can do in clinic, and the patients have great relief after, improved range as well. So it's, so it's a good thing to keep at the back of your mind uh, for treatment for frozen shoulder. Sometimes, you know, you could do that a couple of times. It still doesn't resolve. In the really retrousant cases, you often need to perhaps get a surgical opinion for an MUA or an arthroscopy to help release the capsule. Uh, I would say, you know, in this case history, there are a few factors, including prediabetes, hypercholesteremia, you want to make sure that you've ruled out any medical causes of frozen shoulder, and that's often you know, part of your medical workup as well. Just remember that frozen shoulder has different stages, so it depends on where you're getting this, the, the patient. Often they don't really present in the first 
painful stage where the, where the shoulder is freezing up because they think, oh, no, it's a little bit sore, it's going to get better. And they come to you when it's really restricted and, and you haven't got much movement there, then that's when they typically tend to present. You know, if you, if you leave it on its own, it, it, it tends, to, tends to get better, but that can take many, many months. And most people can't live with extremely painful shoulders. It's really disrupting to their day-to-day -day lives. So they want something done sooner rather than later. Right, learning points for that case. Important to work out what phase you're in from a shoulder, uh, frozen shoulder point of view. Um, corticosteroid injection, hydrodilatation procedures work really well. If you're going to do that, you have to time it with your physiotherapy. So that's where the communication between you and your physio um, as, as, a, as a medical doctor is key because you might say, look, I'm going to inject. We really need to maximize the rehabilitation from that point of view and get them lined up from that point of view. Right, next one. So this is where it gets uh, a bit juicy. So we've got a 25-year-old National Levis tennis player. Two weeks ago, was in the gym doing flies. Yeah, it's, This is a female, by the way. So really doing really heavy flies, so butterflies with the dumbbell going out like that. Now feels clicking and uh, pain sensation when in the gym. Also feels that the shoulder starting to go a little bit and feels a bit unsteady or wobbly when, it, when, when she's serving. You do your exercise history, you know, you, you, she obviously plays a lot of tennis, given that she's very good. Um, she has a full strength and conditioning program, very hot and that kind of stuff. Enjoys other activities like windsurfing and being fit and active. Any thoughts? Peck tear? Yeah, from the flies? Yeah, yeah, not a bad shout. Slap lesion? Actually, peck and biceps tendon are very intrinsically linked. So that, that is a common mechanism, you're right, of getting a pec tear. The thing that does it for me is the, you know, the feeling and the serving. So you know, for out, they're getting that to the extreme ranges, they're getting that clicking, they're getting that sensation. So is there something going on within the, the glenohumeral joint, like a slap tear uh, or a lab any form of labral tear? Using data is really key. So actually, uh, when you get to this sort of level, you can ask things like, or you can find out things like what's the, what's the surf percentage speed drop? That's a really, really sensitive sign in terms of shoulder injuries. Uh, and often, you know, that's something that patients can't make up. They, you know, they're trying to go for their speed and the average speed goes down. You can look at things like revolutions on the ball. So how many revolutions or how much top spin they're getting. That also goes down drastically when they've got uh, issues and musculoskeletal complaints, particularly in the upper arm. Um, yeah, and also when is it sore? So we talked about the late cocking phase. So that's basically when they're just about to release the shoulder and throw through. And that's when the symptoms seem to be worse. Again, you can use... Um, video analysis, video footage, and get just on an iPhone, get lots of lots of helpful data, almost just as useful as that kind of stuff, just from home, home equipment. So we've gone through our assessment again. What we might find is visual inspection. There's going to be asymmetries there, right? There's certainly going to be asymmetries in a tennis player who's dominant-handed. Uh, you, you might find a bit of thoracic spine mobility and restriction. Scapular dyskinesia, you're certainly going to find a bit of that, which could be functional and could be normal. Uh, but I think we'll focus on the scapula at the moment in this particular case. So just to remind you that you know, there are lots and lots of muscular attachments to the scapula, and they move in lots of different directions. So this is a complicated uh, articulation between the, sc the scapula and the chest wall. Uh, so scapular rhythm is, is very, very actually difficult to, to ascertain, and everyone is different from that point of view. Most players and most people will have some form of scapular dyskinesia. Uh, and you can have a, what we call a sick scapula if you meet sort of certain criteria. But actually, just looking at general scapular motion is important, understanding you know, what asymmetries could be uh, improved and what are completely normal. There are a few medical things to look out for. Medial winging, lateral winging, and yeah, there could be uh, medical causes for that or even iatrogenic causes for that. Um, the lateral winging in particular is usually an iat iatrogenic thing, so people who've had surgery or various complications, uh, particularly with the head and neck, can sometimes cause lateral winging. Uh, medial winging, you often see in, in patients who are very active gym goers, so you almost get a palsy of the long thoracic nerve, which knocks out um, serratus anterior from that point of view. 
This is more commonly what we see, functional scapular dyskinesia. So our movements go up, and you can see actually that you know, the right scapula isn't, isn't moving as well or isn't, it's just pointing out um, from that point of view. Um, and that is, again, usually from muscular imbalances across the thoracic girdle. Tightness in pec minor and upper traps in particular, but also weakness in levator scapulae, rhomboids, and the lower traps. So those are the things that you can try and target your rehabilitation on. And that's where rehabilitation starts, in, uh, it really should start in any, any shoulder case. So, we'll move on to our labral tests. We're thinking about the labrum, we think, you know what, actually, let's do some specific labral tests. Ones I like to use are called like an inferior distraction. So getting to stabilize the shoulder, so um, it's a hand on my shoulder, that's all right. And you just give a bit of a, a distraction down, and if there's a little bit of pain around the, uh, because you're grinding into the labrum, then that's quite sore. You might want to see the stability of the shoulder. Like, is there an element of shoulder instability with labral tears? And that, that's often, you, they, they come together. So you might just want to have a general feel. So you've got the weight of the shoulder, get them nice and relaxed. You can see what the shoulder movement is like. Let me turn around, actually, I can show them that. So you can see what the, you stabilize the, the scapula as best as you can. What's it like in an AP motion? And what's it like in a downward motion? Is there, is there a sulcus sign? Can you see big gapping under the acromion? What's going on from that point of view? Again, lots of special tests for labrum. The ones I like using are O'Brien's. So that could be holding your arm there and asking the patient, pretend they're opening a curtain. So pretend you're opening a curtain from that point of view. Okay, relax, and now push up against me. So again, just making sure um, there's no irritation where the biceps tendon comes in and forms that anchor into the superior labrum from that point of view. So you often ask the patient to come and shuffle over all the way to the side of the bed as far as they can go without falling off. So now you can see, you can stabilize the scapula much better, right? So now you can get a true test of external rotation from that point of view. Oh, and there was a pop there. How, you okay with that point? Yeah. Not done your stretches this morning. No. So you can, get a, you can get an idea of what true external rotation is, yeah? So actually, even on her non-dominant side, her left side, there's a lot of rotation she gets from that joint. And you can feel when the scapula is moving from that point of view, right? And... What I might do is you might catch the labrum on the outer side there when you're really in end range. You can do a grind test. So again, stabilizing the scapula. You can really get them grinding that outer range. And then you can push in as well. So you can get like an axial load this way and a scour test. So it's very similar to... Um, so there's a little bit of instability going on here. Are you quite flexible? Yeah, so that's when you might want to say, actually, I'm going to do a hypermobile screen, a mobility screen from that point of view. So you can actually feel there's a bit of, bit of shoulder movement in there as well. So very flexible. So when you do a, uh, there's a thing called a crank test or, or a Job's test. It's important to understand, is it pain or is it instability? Is there an apprehension that the shoulder is going to move out or is it a pain from the point of view? Um, and often they're combined and sometimes they can be separate. And sometimes uh, you can have just instabil instability and sometimes you can have just pain. So what I tend to do is if there's a patient in that point of view, I, I stabilize the shoulder, get them to feel really comfortable. Patients who are apprehensive will not want to be in those ranges, will resist you anyway. But if you can get the patients relaxed, you go back, you say, tell me when your symptoms come on. They say yes, and then you do a slight relocation test. So you're pushing down, and you're recentering the the the, the humeral head in the glenoid, and that should remove the pain. Uh, and we're used to just let it go and surprise them, to, so it pops back in. That's a very cruel thing to do. So, uh, if the pain and instability resolves, you say okay, that's fine. And you gently sort of release off again. It's a very apprehensive position for that to be in. You don't want to flare something within the joint as well, from that point of view. Stability of the shoulder, just remember there's lots of structures stabilizing the shoulder joint. So you, know, you break them into your primary stabilizers or your static stabilizers and then your dynamic stabilizers. Essentially, your, your static stabilizers are the shape of the joint, the labrum, and the capsule. So the capsule is just not one blended uh, sheet. It's got lots of, lots of thickenings in it as well. So from that point of view, uh, lots of different ligaments that form into the capsule. The dynamic stabilizers are the bustles, the rotator cuff, and everything we've spoken about. So just remember, that, you know, there's lots of things contributing. Right, this patient had a slap tear, as we thought. Now, we're changing the surf bar mechanics, scapular mechanics improving, 
Um, we talked about internal deficit range of shoulder. So do we want to get a bit more internal rotation? Is that important? I, th I think so. Do we want to, you know, obviously they need that from a serving point of view. They need the external rotation, but can it be better controlled? Uh, avoid aggravating positions. Sometimes the shoulder joint is really inflamed. Um, so you might also need to be calmed down with an injection or anti-inflammatories. We'll just very quickly zip through slap tears. Four different types. Most of the types you see are this type two. Uh, they're the commonest type. Uh, and you can get a slap tear that's anterior, posterior, or combined from that point of view. Um, these are the type threes and the type fours are where we, where we get our you know, friendly surgical colleagues involved because they're often, they're like a meniscal bucket handle tear. So you're going to have a bit of cartilage, a bit of labrum fl flapping around in the shoulder joint. It's going to be sore, it's going to be painful, it's going to be causing mechanical symptoms from that point of view. And this is 28-year-old, left shoulder pain, playing basketball, falls over onto the shoulder, now has pain around the front. Describes clicking and grinding of the shoulder, right hand dominant. Um, plays basketball, racket, racket sports player as well, uh, but with the right hand. So not left, not um, left on at all, but the shoulder pain is on the left side. So you go through your examination, and actually on visual inspection, when you're doing your uh, general look, and you're then with your cervical and thoracic spine assessment, you notice a bit of scoliosis. Yeah, so a left side thoracoscoliosis. The reason that's important is because that really does affect scapular mechanics. So in this patient, you can see that the left, you, you're going to get a bit of a rib hump and a bit of scapular elevation and protraction. So what that will do over a period of time in the non-dominant side on this particular patient, you're going to get overloading of the anterior structures. So actually, with this patient, she's, um, they've got a florid ACJ synovitis, which means that the ACJ is really, really inflamed. You, could, you would expect that in the right dominant side, but actually this is the left, left non-dominant side. So something has, not, has, not, um, uh, has been aggravating that over a period of time. And then you really want to think about biomechanics as well. You want to just make sure you're as symmetrical as possible, and sometimes surgical intervention in the ACJ is required. And this, this particular patient actually had to have an excision of the ACJ to help with their symptoms. Moving the ACJ, is there any crepitus? Is there any clicking? And then you can get the shoulder across that way and give them a squeeze. And on the squeeze, they'll be like, oh, that's sore. Uh, and often they can get aggravation from that point of view. Just a few pathologies with the ultrasound here. Um, we, we, we can talk through these. Uh, top left is biceps. Um, pathology. So you can see a tear here in the rotator cuff. That's causing the two ends of the cuff to be retracted. Sometimes you can see joint pathologies. So here you can got a, you've got a big glenohumeral joint effusion. Um, so that means there's been significant trauma within the glenohumeral joint. And this is looking at the shoulder joint from the back. Uh, and as we've seen here, subacromial bursitis from that point of view. Thank you very much.